my juicy co-creators, Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour Europe. I am so excited. I'm in Windsor, England with Derek. Hello, Derek. Hi, Lilu. This is Derek is one of the latest A House authors, and I'm very, very excited because I just met Derek, and this is a very powerful story, and you're going to be so inspired by it. I think so. I think you will. And uh, Derek definitely knows how to share his heart, his light, and will inspire you to flip your life around as he did. This is tremendous. You're, so you wrote this book, The 10 Second Philosophy, that I'm holding in my hand. Um, and... Uh, that it is really a practical guide to releasing your inner genius. So you found your inner genius in those, like in the flip of a second, in a moment where all of a sudden your current life just didn't make any more sense. And you, and you, and you what? What happened there? Well, the first thing I did was I, was I stopped. I literally stopped and I paused and went inside. What I realized when I paused was that the life I was leading was, was not even my own. It wasn't um, one I was happy with. I was almost depressed. I was clinically unhappy, as well as being broke financially. I stopped and went inside introspectively to discover who I really was as a person. And I call that my, my true self. The true self is the core being, the essence, the spirit that we came here with, who, who we really are. And most of my life, up until literally you know, this moment a few years ago, I had been living a life of non-self that wasn't me, that I knew wasn't me, but I've been ignoring the signals from the universe, ignoring the, I, the, the uncomfortable feeling, the unhappiness, the broken and fractured relationships. I've been ignoring all of that and stayed in non-self. The moment I began to sink and go inside and look introspectively to discover who I really was, then to pay attention to the message that came from my core, my true self, my life changed overnight, mm. quite literally. That's why I call it the, ten, the book, The Ten Second Philosophy, because whilst time takes time, change happens in just moments, mm. exactly. So within 10 seconds, I have to go inside and realize I'm not happy. I'm happy because I'm not who I really am. And you can't be truly happy is not you. So the key, therefore, to happiness is discover who you are, mm. discover who you truly are, and then having the guts, the courage to be that person in your world. Mm. Yeah. Your parents immigrated from Jamaica. You were in England. You still live in England. You were a, a financial planner, well, in the financial yes. business. Yes. That was not working. Tell us, I love this story. Oh my God, you're going to love this. Well, actually, my, um, my parents yeah, my parents came here from Jamaica. And they, uh, you know, came with, with their, with their uh, parents. And they met again. They got married in the UK. Had seven children. I'm child number five, by the way. And... Um, Basically, uh, just, just, just one day, I had a real traumatic uh, position in my life where getting home from school one day, uh, as I g burst in the door that was part open, my, f my house was full of family and friends and people that, uh, that, that I knew, and I didn't know why they were there. And quite literally, as I looked around, looking for my mother and looking for the bus, see where she was, and she didn't get off the bus, she normally got, got off. And... As I was looking around, suddenly a neighbor burst into the house and shouted, Mavis is dead, Mavis is dead, and she started weeping. And that's how, when I was age 13, that I found out my mother had died. So her, her death really affected me, you know, traumatically, emotionally, because it literally took my voice away. I found that um, from that day onwards, I, I literally couldn't speak. Um, you know, I was so close to her that, you know, that day, I, I remember being by my bed and and holding on to it and saying, "This can't be true. You know, it, it's a it's a dream. It's a mistake. It's not true." But when I woke in the morning, it it, it was real. It was and she, and she was dead. But her, her death took my voice away, and I literally found that I couldn't speak for the first two weeks. But after you know, the funeral, what happens is that people leave, don't they? And the the friends you know go away, and the funeral was over. We go back to school, and the very first day at school. I found that I, I had an incredible stutter and stammer because the way that the uh, universe collaborated that day was to have me, the teacher, have a reading lesson that day. And she, um, she asked me to read from this book. And it went something like, you know, as I tried to read, I was just going... And 
I eventually blurted out, I can't speak. Mm. And I, I just buried my, my head in my hands and all I could remember, even now, I can, right now I can, I, can, I can hear the children giggling and laughing around me and the murmuring and whispering and me just feeling humiliated because I now had this incredible stutter. And that stayed with me really right through my teenage years and college and into my early 20s. And um, I stuttered right into my young adult life. And now you, I mean, now I know the story because you're literally, you, you have, you, you can speak in front of large, large crowds. This is a very amazing success story in the sense that you, you've, you've been able to overcome uh, a lot of things that we, a lot of us have this fear of public speaking. Yeah. And, and you were, you literally had even, you couldn't even speak and yet you went beyond. What is the process of okay. just stepping in fully of saying I'm going to make this and I'm going to be one of the best speakers on the planet because you can you can you can go on stage and you have standing innovations. Right. Yeah. I mean just recently in um I spoke in Anaheim in June this year to seven and a half thousand um uh, wealth managers, insurance agents and financial planners from, from I think it was 80 countries around the world and uh, I, I I loved it. I really enjoyed it and uh, at the end they gave me a standing ovation. Um, but that was From humiliation to standing ovation. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, yeah. But interesting. That's maybe your second book. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, that could be it. But certainly, from that humiliation as a as a child. But that's um, my shift. Actually, came. The universe conspired and collaborated to when I was 25 years old. I was in the office working as a you know as a trainee, and the the, the manager of the company said to me, "Could I introduce him to some new potential recruits?" So. I explained, of course, that I couldn't do that because I can't speak properly and I can't do that. But he said, well, there's no one else around. Um, all you have to do is say a few words, introduce me. There's 16, 15 people in this small room. Give me a nod through the door and I'll come in. Well, I stood in front of these 16 odd people and I don't remember what I said, but I know that I stuttered and I spluttered and I sweated. Uh, and I eventually managed to just say, Dennis, and Dennis came in the room and I had the ignominy you have to stay in the room with all those people knowing how badly I did and um, but about two weeks later I'm um, I'm in the office and uh, a letter arrives and it's addressed to me personally which is unusual but I was just you know a junior in the office and it's from this young lady who'd been in the audience that day of my awful introduction for Dennis and she uh, wrote in this letter how she'd applied for a job as a trainee and she had this experience that background this qualification and she didn't get the she didn't get the job so what she said to me was that I didn't get the job and I can't believe I didn't get the job when someone like you Mr Mills can be working at the company someone who can't even speak properly and as she as she wrote and who babbled incoherently can be working at the company and I can't so well what I, do, I don't know well I don't know what's in her mind, but I'm guessing her intention wasn't positive <laughs> in terms of sharing that with me. What I do know is that in that moment, I recognized that she was right. Mm -hmm. I couldn't speak properly, but I made a decision in that moment, call it my original 10 second moment, if you like, if we have these moments in our lives that we ignore or do something with, we either capture and take inside or we don't. So in that moment, I just um, said to myself, I am going to learn to speak properly for the second time. So I went on speaking courses with Dale Carnegie and others, and, um, and was able to find that I could speak better and better than I worked on it and practiced. So, you no, know, but I didn't become a, a speaker speaker. <laughs> that only happened two years ago. So, but the key issue for me was that I, I was able to do a bit better in my financial services business. But I was still at the bottom of the list <laughs> in terms of producers. Because, um, you know, I worked in financial services uh, for now for 26 years. But the first 18 years of those, I was one of the worst performing agents because I was just wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, apart from being unhappy, I was a real failure at getting the results. And um, and then one night, you know, everything changed, and I was able to share that through my talking and through and through my book. Yeah, this is this is really incredible. To so you had already originally this kind of this glimpse. You were already a yes. person that could think, because we're going to talk in in shortly, very shortly about those ten seconds. Yes. What happened in the office yes. that uh, made you from a, 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 bro, a, a broke broker, if we could say, to a millionaire. So. <laughs> 
So uh, you you were already this kind of person though that could flip things around. When you put your mind in something, well, you, you you like uh, you get it. Yeah, I guess that uh, right then, oddly enough, um, it came out of humiliation that letter because I remember just being in the office and I, I didn't want to read the letter again because. I knew, <laughs> fun as it sounds now, I knew that if I read that letter again, that people could read my thoughts. So the office would be able to hear my thoughts. So I screwed the, le <laughs> I screwed the letter up and I threw it in the bin and just being fearful to read it again. So I made a decision. So yeah, in that moment, I made a, des made a decision. And in life, what I now know is that life, the universe often collaborates to give us words, thoughts, questions, phrases, and ideas to wake us up mm -hmm. and to say, have a look at things again or stop doing what you're doing, or maybe look at things in a different way. But oftentimes, for me and for the people, certainly as I was then, we would all ignore them. And when the whole universe conspires to give you a message, a word, a thought, a question, a phrase, an idea, to ignore that, well, that caused me a lot of pain for a very long time, right up until um, my late 30s, when right through my uh, 20s and 30s, I'm married with four children, and having what I call really poor quality life because not only have we not got any, any money, we are, I'm working too many hours. I'm working six days a week, not seeing my wife, not seeing the children, mm -hmm. working weekends. And there came a point in the office um, up to 2000 and at the end of November 2003 where I knew, I wasn't depressed because <laughs> I wasn't clinically diagnosed, but I was certainly clinically unhappy. Mm -hmm. So being clinically unhappy and broke, and I'm in the office, and then what I, the person who I call my first coach just turned up and asked me a question. And often in life, just a question can change everything. Mm. So this, this person, this kind of, uh, you had never seen him before. I love it because there's sometimes those people, don't they, they show up in our life and you're like, who's this angel? Absolutely, absolutely right. I'm in the office one night and uh, you know, I, know I, was, I was really, really at a low point particularly not seeing my wife and children, knowing what it was doing to those relationships. And I was moving around bits of paper, wondering who, can, who I can call the next day. My normal practice was to drive anywhere in the country, see any bit of client for a bit of business here. Because oftentimes when you're struggling, it's just for cash flow, just to get some money in. And even you know, survival you know, mode. Survi survival mode. Yeah. But I've been in survival mode, uh, had been in survival mode for, for almost 18 years. I just, But that night, the universe collaborated again. And this time I paid attention. Because at that moment, about 9.30 that evening, the security guard came into the office and the security guard, we, have, we work on a, on a large complex and they always, they're always changing the guards. Changing the guards. <laughs> and, 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 um, <laughs> sorry. And um, the guard just knocked on the door and said, no, is it time to lock up? It's 9.30. And I said, just give me 10 more minutes. And then he just walked away and I just shuffling some more bits of paper. And he came back and I said, just give me two more minutes, please. And, he, and then he just said to me, um, Derek, he said, what time do you get in this morning? And I said, um, well, I said, uh, 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. But as he, he began to walk away, and I realized I've been up since 6, on the road since 7. It, it was 8 o'clock in the office. It was now almost 10 o'clock in the evening. And this had been my regular pattern, my regular way of being and existing. And in that moment, as I stood in the office, it was almost if I, I mean, the only word I can really explain is it, like an epi epiphany or a complete shift because my, 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 my awareness went inside and it went to a, r a real introspection for a few seconds. I went completely inside and what came out of, 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 came out of me was that you're not happy. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you're not happy is you're not who you truly are. And you can't be truly happy as not you. What came out for that in those moments was that I'd been setting goals, by the way, for 18 years. I follow the plans, follow the books, been on the courses, setting goals for 18 years. And after 18 years of setting goals and doing those plans, I was still broke and I was still unhappy. So what came out of me was goals don't work. So it's good to to first look at stop for a second yes. and and and, and yeah. see just where where are we in our life you know take it take a little bit of kind of a snapshot of the situation huh yes it is because it's recognition of of where you are but then it's about going inside because our i mean the book is called the 10 second philosophy a practical guide to release <laughs> it's a baby practical guide to releasing your inner genius and it's called that for a reason because I believe that everyone has a genius inside of them yeah. and what we do in our lives from when we're around 
10 or 12 years old is we allow the world to lock out our genius, so to lock it inside of us and to cause us not to be that person any longer. But actually, occasionally in our lives, we get a chance to go back inside. And that, that question from the security guard, what time do you get in this morning, means nothing to most people. But what I found is that it took me inside and caused me to look introspectively. So as I stood there in the office, it was it's almost like having a, a whirlwind and calmness at the same time. Mm-hmm. Because as a whirlwind, I knew something was happening. But at the same time, I was absolutely centered and knew that this is right. And what came out of me was to stop setting goals and to start setting standards for how I was going to be and who I was going to be every single day because goals weren't working for me. What came out of there was I had to be myself, to find my true self. What was most important though is that this voice that was speaking to me, I recognized it. Mm-hmm. And it was my voice. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was my own intuition. It was my own heart. It was a place where I thought, this is me speaking. And in that moment, I was listening and I paid attention yeah. and, and it changed my life. And it was a gentle voice, wasn't it? A soft, gentle, loving voice. It was a soft, gentle, loving voice and it came with a feeling to, to say that this is absolutely you at your core. So what, what I learned just you know, re- on reflection is that when we stop, pause, just go inside and go deep to the inner voice and listen to the inner voice and find who we are and hold that place, hold that space for ourselves and pay attention almost like a mini meditation. The next thing to do once you're in that place is to pay attention to the words, thoughts, questions, phrases, and ideas that come from that place. Mm -hmm. Because that's the inner you. That's the you that's connected to everything else. That's the you that's connected to the universe, to your, it is your true self. It's part of everything else, part of the oneness, part of the energy, the spirit that we all are. So when that place speaks to you, like an inner angel, it makes sense if you sent an angel to, to listen to the angel. And that's the inner self. So for me, it was around, I knew what was coming from there was absolutely right. So that night, I completely changed my whole life. See, my shift in terms of how the world could see it took weeks, months, and years. But in fact, the real shift took seconds, about 10 seconds. Because I realized in that moment, I'd had, an, from, outside, from inside of me here to, into my outside world, I discovered a new philosophy, my own philosophy. See, we all have... Lily, I, I think that we all have an inner genius, a true self, and that inner self contains our personal philosophy for success and happiness, mm-hmm. whatever that means to us, because it's a personal thing. So, the, so my journey has become, since those years, of sharing with other people how to release their inner genius and to listen to true self and to stop setting goals and start setting standards. Mm-hmm. Do you want me to explain? Yeah, so instead of, yeah, and also instead of uh, living by other people's rules and uh, how we were raised, it's more about, okay, what what would work for me? Yeah, I think it's a great way of putting it because what I noticed in that moment, and I've shared and, and, and more has been come through me, is that goals, when we set them for a week or a month or a year or 10 years or 20 years, those goals are for the future. Mm-hmm. And what most people tend to do, and I used to do this, is when I used to set goals, I'd attach some of my happiness and my, and my contentment to that future goal. And that's where it stayed, out in the future. So I'd be happy next week, next year, three years, 10 years, when I've got this, when I've done that, when I've been there, whatever. And of course, it meant I wasn't happy in the now. Mm-hmm. Whereas standards are a now experience. Standards are a basis, a criteria, a level, a rule, or a quality that you set from within that you go inside and you find, okay, for me to operate today, what are the basis criteria, rules, levels, and qualities that I can operate from from the inside just for today? So you reinvent it daily? Exactly. So the idea, I think we are renewed daily, So, but we are checking back in with ourselves. Mm-hmm. So essentially what we're looking at is goals are from the outside world, the company, the business, the economy, friends, family, whatever, and you have your goals and you think, well, I've been, since I was about 10 or 12, been told to have this and do this. But all that really did was it took you away from who you truly were. Well, standards say, go back inside. Go back and disguise inside and discover your true self and set standards from that place. The thing about standards, you only do them for one day. Not for three weeks or not for three years, so one day. You set a standard for you of how you're going to be just for today. And that makes life infinitely easier because I, I can do this for today. Yeah. I, I can do this, just, you know, 2,000 years ago, a gentleman walked on the planet and he said many wise things and to some he was the son of God 
and to others he was a prophet. But he gave us some words. And the words that, that I've known since I was a child began to resonate with me. And what resonated with me was he said these words, and these words were, give us this day. He didn't say give us this week, or give us this month, or this fiscal year, or this three-year business, or this 10-year decade. He, didn't say, he said give us this day. And I thought there's a message there that it's about finding you and getting the best of you and your true self into the world today, just for today, the best of you in the world, yeah. just until you get your head back on your pillow tonight. Can you do that for one day? And my view, my personal view is that if he, if it was supposed to be give us this month or this year or this decade, whatever you believe, he would have said so. He would have told us that. It was give us this day. So standards are a narrow experience. Standards are set up your rules and criteria and bases and levels from within. And you commit to living at those standards mm -hmm. just for today just for today. And God willing, if you have tomorrow, then you say it again, yeah. just for today. You look inside and you stick with those standards that you set from within. Then you start to be true and live life as your true self. But there are benefits and the fringe benefits are, as I found and people I've guided and coached have found, that the more you use standards to go inside, the more of your true self is revealed to you. Mm -hmm. And the more of your true self and your inner genius gets to play in the world. Mm -hmm. And you just turn your life on completely. Something that is quite uh, poignant about you or that I can see, and I wish I had a camera right on you so we can see your eyes. And Derek has beautiful eyes that are, you're moved and touched. I could see your emotions also. It's, uh, what, what, what are those emotions? Why? Because I feel it's life-giving, you know, those moments where we realize... I don't know if it's from gratitude. I don't know if it's from just remembering those events, from reliving them. From but I feel this is like a, an essential thing coming out in those moments. Mm. What moves yeah. you? Yeah, for me, Lulu, what what moves me is um, is love of people, and it's really simple because I'm a human being. I'm a person, and because I've got to know my true self more and more, and a true self isn't a a black or white thing, as in it's like a light switch that goes on or off. True self is actually a continuum. So you discover more of yourself. And the more I discover of myself, the more I realize I am everybody else. Mm -hmm. And everybody else is me. So it's in love. And now, gosh, everyone is like this. Everyone is like this. So it's about loving people to a degree where w my life is around making those differences to help more people to discover who, the, who they really are. Um, the background, my, the stuttering, losing my mother when I was 13, and the financial problems right through my adult life until a few years ago. That, that's one thing, but that was nothing more, I, I look back now and say it's nothing more than recognition of my journey. The, the, what, came, what comes come out of me and what stays with me now is that we are all one. This is oneness. And if, for example, you know, we recognize that we're all one, as in we are one unit, that we, we, we would love each other more. We would hold each other more. We would do more for one another. And say, for example, you know, in my right hand, I have a gun. If I had a gun in my right hand, I would not go and shoot myself in my left hand. It would, I just wouldn't do that because we wouldn't do that to ourselves. Why wouldn't we do that to ourselves? Because we recognize if we do that, we're harming ourselves. So for me, the greatest journey for me is helping more people around the world to recognize that we're all one body. And therefore, when we do harm to one person, we're harming ourselves, but it's recognizing that oneness that makes us go, well, if we are one, we would nurture that. Same way the body does. And if I'm, you know, I wouldn't, my right hand wouldn't harm my left hand, but if I'm thirsty and, I, and my body tells me I'm thirsty, my, my right arm reaches for a drink, but I'm not close enough to the glass. So my feet just take me there. And my feet take me to the drink and I can drink. So I didn't have to ask the feet to serve me. The hand wasn't asked by the heart or the body to serve it. It's recognition that if there's a need somewhere in the body, that the whole body responds to serve the whole. And when the drink is taken in, the system that we have distributes that water, that life-giving water, to the whole system, mm -hmm. to all extremities. And the brain save the heart, serve the heart, and the heart serves the brain. We nurture. So for me, it's around recognition and a duty for me to realize who I am. And in recognition of who I am, I realize that we're all the same. And therefore, how can we share the message to say we're all one? Because if we can have that shift to make more people recognize that we're all one thing, then we, the world changes, doesn't it? It's recognizing that we're all one. So that's where my energy and, and I, you know, I'm often moved by things that don't move people because and the, those things are 
the circumstance that I find other people in. Mm. And, um, and you can relate. I, 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 I can, I can relate. Feel, and your heart relate, feels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my heart relates, and I feel, and I, you know, and I cry, and I, I'm like, wow, because, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a human being. It's, it's, it's a part of me. I came here, you know, another expression of the, of the universe, the way that it operates, and the way that we came here as, as entities. You know, we don't know, I, I don't know what we were before we were born. I don't know whether we came to creation at conception or birth. My my real belief is that it's before that, but I don't know. I don't know what we're going to be after we've shuffled off, shuffled off this life and move on to who knows where. I have a belief around what happens after this life, but I don't know. Here's what I do know. I know that we're here on this planet as expressions of the universe to help and nurture and to guide and experience with and through and for one another in love and in light with one another. And to do that and to share that message means we can start working with one another and delighting one another and, and doing things that in recognition of we're here. We're here now in these physical bodies on a physical plane to, to help and to share and to love others mm. on this same journey because you know we're here. And for most, for you and I and our listeners, uh, I think we're free, as free as we can be. But there are souls in this world who are not free. They come to here to experience, and they're in, uh, in in the mud in Africa, or in difficulties in Asia, or starving somewhere else. Now, when we recognise that this is right hand, and this is left hand, we're part of the same body, and we can share that message as a personal philosophy that true self is also one self, that we're all the same thing. We can change the world. We can, we can genuinely change mm. the world, mm -hmm. and that 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 recognition starts from within. Yeah. So it's more than just you go in and change your life, become successful. If you go within, and you can change the world. Well, thank God for those ten seconds, because my goodness, you were, you were, he was, he was in financial planning, and thank God you yeah, stepped yeah. in, and now you can share all this beauty and uh, and have this book out and be yourself and who you are. We wouldn't have heard that. You wouldn't. There's so many consequences to it and the rippling effects. I mean, you're, the abundance start flowing in. Tell us about how that changed oh, in, wow. your, in your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's yeah, finish yeah, by that. Cause it's that because, <laughs> yeah, w when, thing, when say things change overnight, I know that when you change, everything will change for you. So it become, the change becomes, but the world might not see that change straight away. But after my difficulties and getting to the point where one day um, I'm in the office and my wife calls and she says, Derek, uh, the bailiffs are in the house. It wasn't for the first time. And I said, it's okay, what do they want? And they weren't taking anything, they were just gonna just value our furniture. And he said, they're in the house. And I said, um, okay, I'll sort it out. I'll, I'll, that'll be okay, I'll sort it out. And said, you remember that mom and dad are coming from Ireland today? My wife's parents were Irish. And I said, yes. He said, well, they're here now, and the bailiffs are here with mom and dad in the house. It got that bad and saved my house from foreclosure a couple of times. And um, there were challenging times, there's, there's no doubt. But after my shift and those 10 seconds, which I was able to access my true self, I literally uh, turned on and was able to go inside within, within three years of that shift. And what came out of me, the genius that began to lead me, I became a millionaire. And you now the year after that, I earned a million dollars in just one year. And since then, I've done, I've travelled the world, spoken around the world, um, played polo. I had a polo team and shared what I call real life skills and real love with people with money who can make a difference. Because that to me is, see, the thing for me is that people fall into two categories, and maybe on the mountain or off the mountain, and we have to reach out to everyone, not just the enlightened. Because there are more people who are not enlightened than there are enlightened. So my view, wherever I went, is to share the message and share some of the philosophy. Uh, on this mountain, and when I call the on the mountain people, the people too are in the foothills or somewhere up the mountain. They're enlightened, they're awake. They understand that we're spirit and that we're connected and there's something here more than we can touch, weigh and measure. But the majority of the world, over 7 billion people, are not awake, mm. are not enlightened, and they're off the mountain. And we have a duty of care to go to those people and say, look, there's something more to this. I know you can't weigh it. I know you can't touch it. You can't measure it. But there's something else there. And to share our message and to bring those people towards the mountain. I think in doing that, we get to wake people up to who we really are as human beings, what it means to be a human being. And on top of that, it means that who knows, who we, we may wake somebody up who goes way up the mountain. 
-hmm. and guides us all because mm -hmm. we don't know who we're waking up but we need to wake up and share the philosophy and get more people to wake up so i know that it in the book i talk about i completely changed my life around became uh, made made money and successful quote unquote but actually the real thing is i became happy yeah. i became centered i realized a connection with everyone in the universe and and uh, realizing that my realization my realize is really to share that message and wake more people up and we'll get them to wake up and as they recognize the difference it can make in their lives I believe they too will go out and get people to wake up and to share the light mm. yeah. well thank you for sharing your light with us we're uh, we're forever changed by that thank you thank you very much <laughs> thank you Derek and his book is the 10 second philosophy oh my goodness this was so delicious thank you so much for this moment Hope to see you around the world. Yes, well, yes indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. And it's, it's, thanks to you. Thank you. Much, much love, my delicious co-creators. Thank you for your love, your light, sharing these kind of videos. Thanks to social media. We can tick, tick, tick quickly get this out. And this is beautiful. I, I'm, I feel so grateful for the internet because this video can go out to all around the world right now in seconds, you know? It's fantastic. It's, it's a wonderful. fantastic vision. That's the, you know, the connection that we all have and it's different ways of using those connections. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So thank you for that. Ah, thank you for all the, these are the beautiful co-creators. Thank you, <laughs> you co-creators. You, you are beautiful and we can create it together and yes. wake, wake more people up. Yes. Absolutely. Much, much love to you guys. I love you. Bye.